Presenting What Evidence Do Stratfordians Really Have? Part 1 Stratford Evidence For this presentation, we will not be doing any puzzles. To begin, we will begin with a quote from Dr. Richard Wagaman. One of the most important intellectual skills that universities try to impart to their students is critical thinking. It is now more important than ever, as ideological extremists and social media spread falsehoods. Departments of English are on the front lines in teaching the skills of critical thinking. So it is especially ironic, even dangerous, that examination of who wrote Shakespeare should be made explicitly exempt from a critical, impartial evaluation of evidence. It is with this in mind that I am going to ask the question, what evidence do Stratfordians really have? But before we continue, we have to discuss the nature of evidence and what it really is. The relevancy of evidence, according to the U.S. National Institute for Justice, relevancy means that the information is probative. The information tends to prove or disprove a material fact. Relevant evidence can be both direct and circumstantial in form. The BC Campus Open Edition textbook Criminal Investigation says, each piece of relevant evidence will be considered based on its probative value, which is the weight or persuasive value that the court assigns to that particular piece of evidence when considering its value towards proving a point in fact in question for the case being heard. From the Canadian Government's Employment and Social Development website, we get this definition of evidence. All the means by which any alleged matter of fact the truth of which is submitted to investigation, is established or disproved. From that same website, they define direct evidence is something that relates firsthand to the fact that one wishes to prove or disprove. Indirect or circumstantial evidence is something that cannot prove the primary fact but which may prove other peripheral or related facts. Now I'm going to give you a hypothetical case. The driver of the white car ran the stop sign, hitting the red car, who was also in the wrong. However, the driver in the white car ran off, making this a hit and run accident. The fellow on the right says, I saw it happen. This is direct evidence, eyewitness testimony. Direct evidence could also mean unalterated and undoctored video footage of the defendant running away from the car. Indirect or circumstantial evidence works this way. Police are investigating this accident. On the driver's side of the white car, they find a wallet. Inside the wallet is the defendant's license. Then they do a fingerprint dusting of the steering wheel and they find the defendant's fingerprints on the steering wheel. When they turn their attention to the gas pedal, there was a muddy shoe print having the same wear and size as a shoe worn by the defendant when he was arrested. These are three pieces of circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence is cumulative. In the pocket Oxford English Dictionary, they define cumulative as representing the sum of many items, depending on many small indications. That, when combined with Mr. Direct Evidence seeing the defendant running away from the car, we can conclude that the driver of the white car was guilty of hit and run. 
circumstantial evidence has consequences. As the late Tom Renier said in The Law of Evidence in the Shakespeare Authorship Question, and quoting William P. Richardson from The Law of Evidence, circumstantial evidence is evidence of some collateral fact from which the existence or non-existence of some fact in question may be inferred as a probable consequence. In other words, if event A didn't happen, would event B still have happened? So if we didn't gather the ingredients for our meal, would the meal still have existed? Then we have incontrovertible evidence. Black's Law Dictionary defines incontrovertible evidence as evidence introduced to prove a fact in a trial, which is so conclusive that by no stretch of the imagination can there be any other truth as to that matter. Law School Application Advice and Resources says of it, incontrovertible evidence means evidence that proves something without any doubt. It is like a puzzle piece that fits perfectly and leaves no room for any other possibility. The Concise Officer Dictionary defines incontrovertible as not to be disputed. It is the same as incontestable, that cannot be disputed. What makes good evidence? As Professor Walter Hurst said in What is Your Authority for That Statement? An Approach to Examining External Evidence of Early Modern Authorship. Let us examine each piece of external evidence closely for the specifics of who, what, where, when, why, and how. And perhaps its relationship to the authorship of a piece of literature will be clearer. Its value, if any, as good evidence of that authorship will be distinct, strong, sharp, and as well-defined as it can possibly be. The main question in this case, is the evidence relative, probative, distinct, strong, sharp, and well-defined enough to lead us to conclude the Stratford businessman had a writing career? Let's begin with the facts of his life. These are all Stratford references, and it is incontrovertible proof that a man named William Shakespeare was born and lived in Stratford-upon-Avon. He was born in 1564 in Stratford, married Anne Hathaway in November 1582, daughter Susanna born May 1583, less than nine months later, Hamlet and Judith were born February 1585. The burial of Hamlet was in August 1596. His coat of arms were drafted in October of that same year. He purchased property in Stratford from 1597 to 1614. He held 80 bushels of corn, probably malt, in 1598 during a shortage of food. R. Quiney asked him for help with a 40 pound loan in 1598. He sold a load of stone to Will and Wyatt Chamberlain that same year. The next year he petitioned the College of Heralds to impale his wife's arms with his in 1599, which was denied. And he defaulted on bonds in 1597 and 1598. He may have owned shares in the lease of a playhouse as early as 1599. He probably sued John Clayton over a seven pound debt in 1600. That probably comes from E.K. Chambers, one of the leading Shakespearean scholars of the 20th century. He sued several others over loans in both Stratford and London, and he was mentioned in several diaries by local townsmen. In 1616, he wrote a will and died and a death certificate was issued. This is all inference from a name or description and arguing from ignorance. Just because these documents and these facts do not mention he was a writer does not necessarily mean he wasn't a writer. However, all of this is still circumstantial. Next we get property deals. 
In particular, I'm going to summarize some of the Stratford properties. He purchased New Place Boarding House in 1597. Five years later, he had enough money to buy the comb land of 107 acres for 320 pounds in May. September of 1602, he made the Chapel Cottage purchase. He purchased tithes for 440 pounds three years later in July of 1605. 20 acres of land were purchased in 1610, five years after that. The negotiations for which were made and begun in 1602. He was issued a surety against losing tithe income because of enclosure on October 28, 1614. Once again, none of this mentions he was a writer. Therefore, the logical fallacy is inference from a name or description. And it is arguing from ignorance as well. Just because they didn't mention he was a writer doesn't necessarily mean he wasn't a writer. However, this is all, once again, circumstantial evidence. Next we have money lending suits. A final judgment against John Clayton was made Easter term 1600. He sued Philip Rogers over payment for a malt sale around 1605. July 24, 1605, he sued William Hubbard over a bond, and John Annabrook was sued by him in 1609, whereupon a final judgment was made on June 7. It is all circumstantial evidence. Next, we have proof of grain forestalling. Forestalling is the act of purchasing grain from a dealer and hoarding it until such times as you can get a much higher price. It was so bad during Edward VI's time that he issued an act of Parliament forbidding it, though it was still practiced throughout the Tudor era. Next we have the Quiney letter, which was not sent. This is the only known letter to the man from Stratford-upon-Avon. Once again, there's an inference from a name or description, arguing from ignorance. Just because Quiney didn't say he was a writer doesn't mean he wasn't a writer. True. However, Stratfordians often dismiss or deny this evidence. The fact that it was not sent strongly suggests that Quiney knew the Stratford businessman named William Shakespeare could not read or write Therefore, he walked straight down Henley Street to give him the request in person. Once again, circumstantial evidence. Next, we have the family documents, such as the baptismal certificate, the marriage license with Anne Watley, the marriage bond with Anne Hathaway, the baptismal record of his children, the burial record of Hamnet, and the death certificate and will of 1616, these, again, do not prove he was a writer. Stratfordians are making an inference from a name or description and arguing from ignorance. Next, we have a problematic will. January 1616, he writes his will. February of 1616, his youngest daughter married Thomas Quiney. Thomas Quiney was fined for non-attendance of church. Therefore, Shakespeare changed his will that same month, and he finalized it in March 1616. One of the logical fallacies that Stratfordians use here is an insufficient sample. You cannot compare two scratchy, almost indecipherable signatures with the handwriting known as handwriting D from the manuscript of the play Sir Thomas More. It just cannot be done. There are too few letters. Next, we have other Stratford documents. These are from 1598. Notice in the blue box that Sturley and R. Quiney and A. Quiney wrote to each other about tithes, money from Shakespeare, and Shakespeare's loan. Why didn't they write directly to Shakespeare himself? 
Why discuss it amongst themselves unless it was because Shakespeare couldn't read? The same year he received money for a load of stone for the road upkeep. He received money to pay for wine for a visiting preacher. And he enrolled in what was known as a subsidy account, which I take to mean an investment fund. Then we have some legal proceedings about the new place deeds and ownership of new place, stretching from 1602 to 1610. He was also godfather to William Walker in October 1608. In 1611, a few things happened, all relating to money. Proceedings over the tithe holdings were held in 1611. He contributes to the cost of the Stratford Bill to Parliament. He leases a barn to Robert Johnson for £22. He issues a bill over the comb default of rent. And he's also involved in proceedings about tithe interest of £60. Next, we have a few contemporary diary references by fellow townsfolk. None call him a writer such as Thomas Green, whose page here is featured in the Folger Library website. Once again, one of the logical fallacies is dismissal or denial of counter evidence. The fact that these diarists did not call him a writer is significant because you would expect in a diary that they say, oh, William Shakespeare, the famous playwright and poet. By this time, at least 1614, Thomas Green would have found out, or at least known, that Shakespeare was a famous playwright and had published him po poems and plays. And yet, he says nothing linking the Stratford man to the works published in London. All of this evidence from points 1 to 8 is circumstantial. The primary logical fallacy with regard to these is inference from a name or description. Don't miss What Evidence Do Stratfordians Really Have? Part 2 London Evidence Thanks for watching Stay safe